The Lord led me to share a message with you guys this morning entitled, A Life Laid Down. A Life Laid Down. And if you got your Bibles, turn with me this morning to the book of Romans, um, the 12th chapter. I've been studying Romans quite a bit here lately, just wrapped up a college course on Romans. And so I want to kind of set a little bit up before we read this. The book of Romans is written by the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to the church of Rome. And the church of Rome is really dealing with legalism. They're dealing with traditions, the Jewish traditions and the Jewish legalism. (coughs) Excuse me. I did not cover that up very well. I apologize. But they're dealing with legalism in the church, right? The Jews are, are... are, are being saved and they're now being converted into Christianity, but they're trying to bring some of that old law, old, old Testament tradition into the New Testament church. And what they're struggling with is legalism versus grace and mercy, right? And we know this, that we are saved by grace. Amen. We couldn't earn it. We couldn't work for it, but we were saved by grace But where does works fit into the equation? Because the Bible said that we were saved by grace unto good works, right? And so I want to set this up because I want us to understand this. We are justified in Christ Jesus alone, right? And so we are saved by grace, but the, the grace that has been shed upon us should put within us a desire to please our Savior, a desire to give back to Him what He has already purchased, which is our lives. And so... Paul is writing here in Romans 12. He has went through several verses and chapters that we we could read talking about grace and our salvation. But he says in verse 1 of chapter 12, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And he goes on to verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, many of us know this verse. We probably have a plaque or something in our house. And I think sometimes we, we tend to skip over these verses in preaching because, well, everybody knows that. But how many guys know that we can memorize a verse or we can have a picture on our wall and never really apply it to our lives? And so this is one of the favorite verses that I that I read often because it reminds me that my life is not my own. My goal in this life is to take the life that God has given me and use it and spend it for Him. And so when we talk this morning about laying down one's life, it's not about brutally killing yourself, but it's saying, I'm going to take the life, the air, the energy that God has given me, and I'm going to use it to bring God glory. I'm going to be willing to say to God, I'm here, use me. Now think about this, because in Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah is seeking God, and he has a vision from God. You guys know the story? Okay, if you don't, you're getting ready to learn it, right? So he has a vision from God, and and in this vision, the heavens opened up, and he's seeing miraculous things. But he hears the voice of God say to him, Whom shall I send, and who will go for me? And I think about the culture that we live in today, and I wonder how we respond to God's call. Because I believe this, God is still calling his children to service in 2024. I believe that God is still calling his people to step forth in obedience to serve him. And I just wonder, when God calls, are we answering? When God calls, how is our response? And is our response like the prophet Isaiah who says, here I am, Lord, send me. Or is it, okay, Lord, use somebody else. Okay, Lord, anybody but me. Because it should be our desire to please our master. We should be able to look at the mercies of God and say, yes, God, I want to spend my life for you. So we're going to look at a few things this morning. And I'm going to challenge us this morning. This is going to be a hard message. Um, Some people may not like it, and that's okay. Um, You can forgive me. We'll, We'll still be brothers and sisters in Christ. But... I believe this, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I'm just going to go ahead and read here. Um, 
Let's, let's just go back to Romans 12. I'm going to look at a different translation this morning. Um, one that I don't often use, but Romans 12, 1 through 2 in the voice translation. It says, brothers and sisters, in light of all I have shared with you about God's mercies, I urge you to offer your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to God, a sacred offering that brings him pleasure. This is your reasonable, essential worship. Do not allow this world to mold you into its own image. Instead, be transformed from the inside out by renewing your mind. As a result, you'll be able to discern what God's will and whatever God finds good, pleasing, and complete. Very similar, but one thing we see different in this passage is this. It says it is our reasonable, essential worship. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought worship's when Billy gets up here and sings. I thought that was when we sing four songs on Sunday morning. And then an altar call. Ain't that worship? Worship is our lifestyle. Worship is what comes out of that. When we come together, we call this time of music worship because that's what we call that segment in our service. But true worship is giving our life to Christ for his service. And so many people, when they do something for Christ, they boast about like they did something big. But the reality of it is, in comparison to what God's done for us, it's probably not a penny in the bucket. And so what does it mean to give God our life in sacrifice to his work. And, and I think before we can get to that point, we have to understand the mercies of God. Let me read on just a little bit here, and we're going to get into the, my points this morning. Paul urges those who read and hear this letter to respond to the good news by offering their bodies, their eyes, their ears, their mouth, their hands and feet to go as a living sacrifice. Paul knows well enough that sacrifice ends in death, not life. But the sacrifice of Jesus changes everything. His resurrection steals life from death and makes it possible for those who trust in him to become a sacrifice and yet still live. But how do we live? We do not live as before, wrapping ourselves in the world and its bankrupt values. We live in constant renewal and transformation of our minds. We live in transformation and renewal of our mind living for him. See, the world tells us, get what belongs to you. Life is about you, you, you. And even our flesh, fleshly nature at birth teaches us that, right? You don't have to teach a kid to be bad. The kid already knows that. The kid already knows how to be selfish. The kid already knows how to want what he wants, right? If you've raised a baby, you know what I'm talking about. They become a toddler and oh my goodness, my sweet little angel has just became a little terror. You put him in a room with other people's kids and what does he do? I want that toy. That's mine, right? And they will hit another kid. Didn't have to teach them that. They just do that. Why? Because our nature screams, I want what I want. Life is about me. But the reality of it is for us Christians, life is not about us. It's about our Savior, Jesus Christ. So when we sacrifice our lives and lay it down, at the foot of the cross, it's no longer about us. Now, there's some Christians that need to hear this today beyond the, even the walls of this church because so many Christians go through their life living selfish lives, professing that they are followers of Christ, but their life does not line up with the name that they bear. God help us. So the first thing we need to do is view God's mercy in our life. According to the Oxford Language Dictionary, mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or to harm. Jesus showed us mercy. He showed us compassion and forgiveness. We deserved death, hell, and the grave, but Jesus had the power to send us there, but chose rather to give us mercy. What is mercy in layman's terms? It's not getting what we deserve. We all deserve punishment. Why? Because God is a holy God. God cannot look upon sin. And we were born into sin. And we can say it was Adam's fault. We can say it was Eve's fault. But if it wasn't them, it would have been one of us. And every one of us have had a nature of sinning. And we can't look at ourselves and say, well, I'm good enough to get there on my own because we're not, right? I have sat down with kids this week that were 8, 9, 10 years old, and I asked them the question, have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you? Yes. Well, guess what? You're a thief, and according to God's word, that's a sin, and, and you've done wrong. Have you ever lied? Have you ever cheated? All these things. And we look at this and go, well, that's not really that bad, Pastor. 
but to a holy, almighty God, it is. But rather than sending us to our punishment, he paid the price for us so that we could be ransomed from that punishment and be set free. And we should view that in our lives and go, man, God, I'm going to give you back the life that you've given to me. We were on a path of destruction. Most of us could sit here, and if we told our stories today, we'd be like, man, I was on that highway to hell, right? It wasn't just a song. We were headed there. But it, the grace of God, God extended himself to us, and he pulled us off of that path and put us on a narrow path and redeemed our lives. And sometimes I think we're ungrateful. Sometimes I think that we reject God. You know, in Romans 9, it talks about Jesus being a stumbling stone for the Jews. And I wonder today, do we still stumble over Jesus? Do we still miss what Jesus has done in our life? It, it's amazing to me how many Christians will tell me, man, I, I, I'm just mad at God. Mad at God? What has God done for you? Well, he took my mom or he took, yeah, but he, he has ransomed our lives. He has redeemed our lives. He has given us new life. Do we understand that today? Are we viewing the mercy that God's given us? I love how Paul writes this in Romans because to me it's like, take off those worldly glasses and lay them down and pick up the glasses of mercy. Look through the lens of something different. Have you ever looked at something wrong and you thought it was something and you're like, wait a minute, that's not what it was at all? Come on. In our culture, we better do that because we think that's a lady walking down the street and it's a dude. Okay, you guys do still awake, still have some humor. I'm just testing the waters here. Was well, sure if you guys were awake this morning or not? But we do that in our life sometimes. For years, before I received Christ as my Savior, I looked at God as a God of judgment, and I was angry with Him because I didn't understand who God really was, right? I met some people who said they knew God, but obviously later on in life, I realized they didn't really know Him. They were religious. They had a form of godliness, but their life didn't look anything like it had been touched by God. And God forbid that we go through our lives fooling ourselves, saying we are something that we are not. But rather, let's make sure that we are children of God, that we are walking like our Father. We're talking like our Father. We're living like our Father. And we are sacrificially giving like our Father did for us. See, we all deserve to be punished, to die in our wickedness, to suffer eternal damnation. But God's mercy has have been spent on us. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, those of us who have put our faith in him have escaped our punishment and have been made free of sin and death. He's rescued us. Oh, the price that was paid that we could be free. Oh, the price that was paid to have our sins washed away. See, Paul urges us to look at these things and to willingly lay our lives at the altar of sacrifice to God. How often do we stop and just look at what God's done in our life? You know, some of us have been on this journey for quite a while. And I think sometimes we forget about those early days. We forget about those seasons and those times of darkness and difficulty where God's carried us, that he's extended his mercy, he's extended his grace. You know what church camp does for me every year? It reminds me of where I was at because I came to Christ. I was raised in church, but I came to Christ at 15 or 16 years old as a teenager. And God was turning my life around in about the year of 1999 and 2000. There was transformation taking place in my life because I had felt all alone. I had felt unworthy. I had felt unlovable. And I wanted to end my life. But God showed me that I didn't even know what life was. So God got a hold of my life. And at 16 years old was the first time I ever went to a church camp. And it was at that church camp I surrendered my life to God. And I went to the altar for the first time in my life and said, God, it's all yours. I'm laying it down. And so when I go to church camp, I'm reminded of what God's done in my life. And I think some of us have to go back and we've got to look at what God has brought us from and say, you know what, God? Wow. I could be somewhere way off from where I'm at today. 
I could be in, in the grave. I could be in prison. I could be strung out and in an alley somewhere. But by the grace of God, I have been brought into His family. I'm now in His home. And I can rejoice. So we need to go back and we need to view those mercies in our life. And when we view those mercies, the only reasonable thing to do is say, God, man, for what you've done for me, I'll do everything. It's all yours. Second thing we've got to do is give ourselves completely to God. Charity Singleton Craig says this in an In Touch article, the real significance of the sacrifice is that once it was made, it was rendered useless to the person who brought it, except for this one purpose, worship. When we offer ourselves to God, we give everything we have in order to worship Him. What does that look like to give your life down and consider it useless? Let me give you some examples of that this morning. How many of you guys heard of name Davy and Natalie Lloyd? Just a young couple. Just a few months ago in May, died at the hands of an angry gang in Haiti. That's willingness. That's laying it down and viewing my life as nothing except for what God has given me to do. I, I'm amazed at this couple. I did not know this couple, but I've done a lot of research. I've done a lot of reading into their life. And young Davy was raised in the country of Haiti. His parents were missionaries there. At five or six years old, he was kidnapped for two or three days by a gang. And as an adult, he had a choice to make, didn't he? He could have said, I don't want to follow in my parents' footsteps. I don't want to be in that place. He could have had a resentment, hatred in his heart toward the people that had once hurt him. But rather, he felt the call of God in his life. And he followed in the path that God called him. And when he went back to the States to go to Bible college, he told every girl that looked his way, you don't want to date me because I'm going to Haiti and I'm going to give my life there. That's a sacrifice. That's a living sacrifice. And it actually cost him his life, but he was a living sacrifice. Every week he was getting emails from the embassy saying, do not go. It's a level four travel advisory. It's not safe. All the missionaries on Facebook and the missionary groups are telling them, get out of Port-au-Prince, don't go there. But he knew nothing else because that was the place that God had called him. And he knew that his life was God's. And he laid it down. Are we willing to even do that? Are we willing to give God our life? Most of us are not because what if he calls me to go to Haiti or Africa or Tanzania? I guess that's in Africa or wherever. What if he calls me and I have to work in kids ministry or nursery? See, we look at things just a little bit differently than we should, I think. Are we willing to do more than spend for God? Are we willing to be spent? You guys know there's a difference between spending and being spent? I love this. This is one of the things that Pastor Don shared with us this week. He told us a story about a chicken and a pig. Everybody loves a good farm story, right? He said one day there's a chicken and a pig and they're out in the barn lot and they get to talking. And the chicken comes over to the pig and he says, you know what? Mr. Farmer, he's been pretty good to us. He takes care of us. He makes sure we have clean water and feed and he makes sure nothing, no predator come and gets us. We ought to do something for Mr. Farmer. Pig says, well, what do you have in mind? He said, I think we ought to cook him a meal. He said, oh, really? What do you think we ought to have? He goes, well, I was thinking breakfast. He said, I'll provide the eggs. He goes, well, what will I provide? Well, you're going to provide the bacon. See, the, the chicken was willing to spend for the Lord, but the pig, he was going to have to be spent. And so many of us, we're willing to spend. We're willing to step out and give towards something that God wants us to do, right? And we sacrificially do that sometimes. We sacrificially give, but too often we don't spend much. Right? I heard one pastor say, when you give to God, do you give until it hurts? How many of us really do that? See, I know that our church is very generous. Our church financially will step up to the plate when there's somebody hurting. I guarantee you if I came in this morning and I told you about a family that had a burnout and lost their home, and I said, guys, we're going to take up an offering, there's no doubt in my mind it would be good. But how many of us would actually give until it hurts? And that, that's different for every one of us, isn't it? Everyone's sacrifice is different because every one of us are in different places. 
my sacrifice is going to be different than John Webel's because I can do things that John can't physically do right now. John's sacrifice is going to be different than mine because of the wisdom that he has and the things that he can offer. But every one of us have got a life to sacrifice to him. Every one of us have got something that we need to place in his hands and say, God, here it is, use me. Are you following me this morning? See, we talk about financial giving, right? And I say, if there was a family in need, some of you $100 would be a sacrifice that hurts. Some of you $1,000 might be. Some of you might be 5,000. You might feel that. Some of it might be 10. But every one of us have got a place where we need to sacrificially give to God. See, the difference between the chicken, he was willing to give up what he got daily. Say, okay, you can have my eggs. The pig, he wasn't going to be no more, was he? And can I tell you, if I'm the farmer, I prefer the bacon over the eggs. Just tastes a little better. Are we willing to be spent for God? Are we willing to lay our lives down for his service? Paul says, this is our reasonable, essential worship. So what is reasonable? That we have been ransomed and rescued by a king that gave his son so that we could be forgiven. What's reasonable service to him? This hit me pretty hard this week because I, I, I often think, well, man, I'm doing so much for the Lord. Not really. Is it really difficult to do the things we do for the Lord? I have people that come to me and be like, we're at church all the time. Are we really? Do we really feel like we're at church all the time? I have people that come and work here at the church and what they do is they come and complain the whole time they're working. Is that really an offering? A sweet smelling savior to the Lord? No, it's not. And then sometimes I wonder, why are they coming and they're serving the church for me? Because surely they're not serving for God if they're complaining and murmuring the whole time they're doing it. Surely we wouldn't do that to our savior. I can understand if you're working for me and you're complaining, well, pastor, it's just too hot. Pastor, we're just doing too many things. Pastor, we're doing this. But are we doing that to God? Are we saying, God, this, just, this thing you've called me to do is just too hard? I can't teach a class for eight weeks. I can't, I can't serve in kids' ministry or youth ministry. I, I, I can't, I can't. Are we, are, is that how we respond reasonably to God? Is that really, really the gift that we want to give back to our Savior? God deserves more than our half-hearted commitment. He does. We often view godly Christians as ones who show up to church weekly, who tithe, but it seems that it's simply spending for the Lord, but the Lord, he desires us to be spent. What is a good Christian? Every one of us could give us a different interpretation. Well, I know a good Christian. They go to church every time the doors open. I know a good Christian. They're willing to give to the church every time there's a need. I know a good Christian. They sacrificially show up and they, they do this for the church and they do that for the church. Well, they're doing that for what? The church. What about God? What about God? What are we willing to give up for God? What are we willing to keep back? Because Paul says, I urge you to give your life as a sacrifice. Give it all to him. There's some dangerous prayers that were prayed in the Bible, right? Think about the prayer that Isaiah prayed. Here I am, Lord, send me. He didn't give God exceptions. He didn't say, well, God, I'm willing, but only if it's in this area, only if it's in this place. God, I'm willing to go and work with whatever you want me to do, whoever you want me to work with, whatever needs to be done, Lord, I'm available. See, I think that's how God wants us to come to him. Open arms, saying, Lord, do what you want to do. Here's my hands, right? And you know what happens in our lives? God places things in our hands. And you know how we have to hold on to them? Open-handedly. Everything that God gives us is a gift, even the, the, the opportunity to serve him. Even the opportunity to work for him. And what I've had to figure out over the years is God has given me some pretty good gifts. He's allowed me to serve in ministries and churches that I truly loved. And you know what I ended up doing? I coveted those things. I remember being a youth pastor at a church. I loved it. 
I loved my youth group. I, I, I loved what God was doing in my life and I held on to it like this. And when God said it was time to go, it was ripped out of my hands and the pain was there. But I believe when God gives us something to do, we should do it openly because God may want to take that from us and give us something better, right? Let's not miss God and what he's called us to do. It's his anyways. It's God, you use me however you want me to be used. God is looking for those in this day and hour who abandon their wants and desires, their wants and desires to follow him. Where is my Second Corinthians 12, 15. Listen to what Paul says. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? And I love what Paul says. I'm, I am most gladly, I will most gladly spend and be spent for you, for your souls. He says, I'm willing to spend, but I'm also willing to be spent for the souls of others. For the souls of others. May I remind us this morning that in Jesus' final moments with his disciples, he gave us a command. And most of us think it's a suggestion, but, or, but the reality of it is it's not a suggestion, it's a command. And it's the great commandment, the great commission, right? We know what the great commandment is, to love the Lord, the God with all the heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and love your neighbor as yourself. But the great commission falls right in line with it. Because he tells us, go into all the world and share the good news. And I just wonder how many Christians today really have sacrificially said to God, I am willing to go. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to tell others. Some of us are worried about surrendering to God because we're afraid God's going to tell us to go to Africa or Haiti or somewhere. God's just trying to get you to go down the street and talk to your neighbors. He's just trying to let you be friendly in the the grocery store and ask somebody if you can pray for them. Did you notice in that verse what Paul says? I'm most gladly. I'm gladly. He's glad. He's willing. He's happy. Some of us walk through our Christian walk acting like we're doing something big for God and we do it grudgingly. It's not what Paul did. Did Paul go through some things in his walk with Christ? He was beaten. He was arrested. He was left for dead. He was shipwrecked, spent days in the ocean. That's spent. That's spent, right? Paul went through some things so that the gospel of Jesus Christ would make it to the Gentiles. Are we willing to be spent like that? I'm going to be very transparent in the next few moments in this church. I've been pastor here for about 16, 17 months, and we've seen growth instantly. The church started growing. People started coming, right? We got up to about 80 people in this church, and it's not about numbers, but we've slowly started drifting off. You know what happened? People heard there's a new pastor. They heard there's some changes taking place. They want to come here for themselves. But where did most of those people come? Where'd they come from? Another church. You know, most churches in this day and age in America, how they grow? From people leaving one church and going to another. But that never was God's plan. And I believe God can call people from one church to another and move them to different positions because maybe God just has called them out and says, hey, I need you to come and help with worship here at Branch. I need you to go to this church so they can have people that can work in children's ministry. God can do that. But that does not mean that God has stopped with his people being obedient to the Great Commission. And then we wonder, why is the church like a yo-yo? Can I tell you, we're not the only one like that. This is the norm. Why is there 81 week and 50 the next week? Because Christianity in America has been more like the world and less like Christ. And we are moved by our emotions and our feelings. And I just didn't feel like going to church today. I can just go watch it on TV. And we have set the Great Commission on the table to look at and go, that's a pretty thing. That's that's for those people that are special that God calls. 
But no, every one of us are special in God's sight and every one of us have been called to go. God didn't call us to be pretty people, dressed up, nice clothes, sitting in pews on Sunday morning. He called us to be witnesses. He called us to open our mouths and to tell others about him. And I'm going to tell you something this morning. The enemy has lied to us. The enemy has told us that people do not want to hear. But I'm telling you, there's a world that's dying and going to hell. And people are looking for hope and truth in this day and age. We live in times. Think about how scary it is for the, for the church of Jesus Christ. How much scarier will it be for people that have no hope? People need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. In our meetings this week, I was visiting with a pastor that lives on the other side of the state over by Cape Girardeau, and he began telling me about their church and how their church is growing. They have multiple campuses and sites, and he goes, man, we've just seen God's hand upon our church. People are going out, and they're sharing the gospel, and he said, we just opened this church up in Kentucky, and he says, the pastor that's leading that said he was a Baptist guy, and he said he went to this training on sharing your faith. And I can tell you guys, Baptist people, they know how to share the faith. They're not afraid to tell people about Jesus. So he says, I went on the streets. I had this training. He began telling people about Jesus. And he said, in that moment, people received Jesus. They begin being empowered by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. And he goes, the pastor said, I didn't know what to do. I've never experienced anything like that. Encounter after encounter, he witnessed the power of God moving in people's life and people receiving Christ. I could ask by a show of hands this morning, you don't have to raise your hands, but if I did, say how many guys would like to see more people being filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in the Holy Spirit? And many of us would raise our hands. But what we want is it for it to be done in this air-conditioned building where we can sit back and watch it happen rather than be the one that's going to be the voice of God in the desert to lost people. We've been going through the book of Acts on Sunday nights. I didn't see an Acts where the disciples had church service and they went out and invited everybody and then the move of God happened. No, the church went outside the walls of the building. They took their faith outside the walls of the building on Sunday. They didn't just leave it in their pews and they went out and they told other people about Jesus. They give them the good news. They presented the gospel and people received it. Then they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the church grew. How is this church going to grow? The only way that Branch Assembly of God in Branch, Missouri is going to grow is if the members of this church get some boldness in their heart to go and tell other people about Jesus and bring them in. So what's that going to take? Death. It's going to take death. See, we get really excited when the pastor says, well, this church is dying or this church is going to die. Can I tell you, that's the only way that we're going to see growth is death. We're going to have to give ourselves up. We're going to have to die to our own wants and our own desires and our own preferences. And we're going to have to say, God, it's all yours. Our own agendas, our own idea of what we think church is. And if we don't, it's going to die anyways. Man, preacher, you got kind of rowdy at church this week, church camp. Yeah. You know why there was kids that received Christ at church camp this week? Because they got it presented to them. Because somebody loved and cared enough about kids to tell them that Jesus is the cornerstone. That you can build your life on anything else, but if you don't build it on Jesus, your life will be ruins. It's what they heard day after day, night after night, was about the cornerstone, about Jesus. And people res responded, kids responded, got saved. Why are the people in our community not receiving Christ? Because it's not being presented. It's not being presented. Because we've told God how we want him to move. God, we want you to bring him to the church so the preacher can preach a message, so that person can say a prayer, and then we have more people in our pews. But that's not what the Great Commission said. But this is really somber. This is really sad. And I'm sorry for that. But it is a message that we need to hear. We can, we can go into the grocery store and stand in line and get to talking to the person behind us. And they'll say, well, do you have any kids? And boy, we'll open up our wallets and we'll be like, look, right? 
and this is my daughter, and this is my grandson, and this is my great-grandson, and we'll go through and we'll show the stranger perfect pictures of our kids. But are we telling them about the one that died on the cross for our sins, that redeemed our life, that blessed us enough so that we could have godly children and have a lineage to follow? We're easily bragging about how perfect our kids are. We got the best kids in the world. Well, what about our Jesus? What about our Savior? We're not worried about telling them how great our kids are. We're not worried that they're going to get offended because you, our kids are better than your kids. But man, we get, a, we get nervous talking about Jesus. Should we? No. Is he not our Savior? Is he not the one? And we go back to Romans 12. Paul says, in view of God's mercies, in view of what God has done for you, that you should present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Living. Living dead. It's really what it is, right? Because it's no longer my preference, my desire, my wants. It's his. What do you need me to do? I'm available, Lord. What do you want me to do? That's where the death part comes into this living dead. We're still alive, but we're not living for us anymore. Now we are living for Christ Jesus. We're not zombies. We've just changed masters. We're no longer living in sin or living for sin. We're living for Jesus. And we're saying that what God has called us to do is worth dying for. Think about the monks. Think about the nuns that live these really strenuous legalistic laws because they're trying to please God. And God's not requiring that from us, right? Have you heard about the monks that live in these monasteries where they have no conversations and they're completely mute? They don't talk at all for God. Sounds horrible, right? But God didn't call us to live this life that's just miserable and without hope and without joy. The sacrifice that he calls us to actually brings us life. It brings us hope. It brings us joy because when we put our life in his hands, he is a good father and he's going to place us in places and positions where we're going to experience the goodness of God. And I think so many of us are scared to follow Christ because we're afraid of the hell that we might have to go through. But the reality of it is, is God's good. When we put our life in his hands, he begins molding and shaping and forming us and he does a work inside of us to a place where it's not miserable. Can I tell you, when God called me to go to Haiti, I was nervous and I was scared. And the first place your mind goes to when you surrender is all the things that you're going to give up. It was the home. It was the friendships. It was the church family. It was the puppy dogs. It was all those things that we had considered treasures that we put before God. And God says, do you love me more than those? Can I tell you, there was a tug of war in my life at the place of surrender. And I've had to go through it more than once. Tug of war. And God keeps saying, do you love me more than those? Do you love me more than your very own life? Are you willing to die for the sake of the gospel? Are you willing to surrender to do what God's called you to do? Church, I'm not calling you to this. God is. God is calling you to lay your life down at his altar to be used by you. What I know is this. When God called me to branch assembly of God, he said this church, this place, these people is going to be a place of hope and a place of healing. That we are going to see people that have been hurt in church come back to church. We're going to be people that have been broken and have messed up lives, see their life get transformed by him. How does it start? It starts by us allowing God to heal us and use us so that we can reach others. I'm telling you, there's a world outside these doors that needs Jesus. And the only way they're going to get it is if we are obedient. We're obedient. See, we try to justify our own lives by saying, well, I know God called me to do that, but I don't really want to do that, so I'm going to do something else can't earn your way back in, right? 
Every one of us is uniquely called by God with purpose. And we think, well, the preachers are the special ones because they've got a calling. No, every one of us have been called by God to do something. Every one of us. We need to quit putting our pastors on a pedestal because we just keep falling off of them. And we need to say, you know what? I have a work to do in this body. I've got a voice. I've got hands. I've got feet. I've got ears. God, what do you want me to do? And I think we need to wrestle with that for a while. I think we really need to churn it in our spirit and say, God, what is it? And some of us probably know right on top of our head what we're called to do. Some of us have probably been wrestling with it for a while. And when you wrestle with God, God's going to win. But God's going to reveal some stuff in that struggle, ain't he? You start wrestling with God saying, God, what do you want me to do? And all of a sudden God will say, this is what I want you to do. And you go, that can't be God because I'm not strong enough. That can't be God because I'm not good enough. That can't be God because I'm not worthy enough. And you know what? Right there is when you find your calling. Because God's looking for people that are unworthy, that are not gifted enough, that don't have the strength to do that so that he can empower them. He does it every time. He does it every time. I told you about my little meeting in Springfield this week. 14 of us pastors sitting around that table. And at the end of our service, multiple pastors weeping, saying, I don't feel worthy to be a part of what we're a part of. Don't feel like I'm good enough. Don't feel like I deserve this. Can I tell you, it's in order to be a sacrifice, it's, it's going to be something amazing. Think about this. The Old Testament, they had to sacrifice a lamb. In order to appease their sins, they had to sacrifice lamb, but it couldn't be just any lamb, could it? What did it have to be? Spotless, without blemish, the best of what they had. It had to be all of those things. So God is asking us through his scripture to become sacrifices for him. And we say, well, I'm not worthy. Well, if he's called us to do that, then we have been called to be something special been chosen. Look at this little church. Look around you. Look at the people that are here. God has chosen us here in July of 2024 to be messengers of him to the people in Buffalo, in Leadmine, in Tunis, in Urbana, in Max Creek, in Branch, in our surrounding areas. He's chosen us to lay it down, to be lives worthy of the call. It's interesting to me. I'm going back to church camp on Monday. And one of the things I've seen in the past four years that I've helped is there's never enough help. They can't get enough volunteers. Nobody wants to serve. And I wonder if it's below us to be a sacrifice. You know, what's amazing to me is I go to camp and I'm blessed every year. I watch kids give their life to the Lord. Yeah, I got to deal with some troubled kids, but I deal with troubled people in church every week. I got to deal with my own self and I'm the most stubborn person in the room. And I think sometimes we, we make the, the thing that God's calling us to do to, to be so much bigger and worse than what it really is. And Paul said, I was just glad to serve. Lord, I'm glad to be spent and to spend and be spent. It's kind of heart-wrenching, really, to think about that. If our true purpose in life is to glorify God by telling others about Jesus, how sad is it that when a church camp comes around one week out of the year, they can't get 12 people to sign up and serve? And the sad part about it is, is the church camp that I go to, it's created up of a fellowship of 23 churches. And they can't get 12 people to show up and serve one week as leaders. Church, we have some problems in our, our churches in America. There's some problems with the Christian faith. And it's not that our churches are outdated. It's not that our buildings need modified. It's not that we don't have a cool catchphrase on our sign or a cool name. It's in here. It's right here. 
It's right here with the hearts of people. So how do we apply this message today? How do we look at our own lives and say, God, because I, I believe that we love Jesus. I believe everyone in this room really loves Jesus. I believe that we all really want God to use us, but we're scared to say, here I am. So how do we take those steps? How do we look down the road and find vision? Because I've been there. I've been in the pew where like, I want to do it, but I don't know what my next step is. If you're going to call me to do something, you're going to have to lay out the way and he will. But we've got to make ourselves available. So I spent some time praying this week. And I began thinking about ministries within our own church that are suffering. Ministries within our own church that are struggling. How do we do them better? I look at Ray and Angela weekly. They're serving our youth ministry and they're pouring into our kids and they've done an amazing job. How do we take our youth ministry to a level that it grows? How do we find and reach more teenagers so that kids can be a part of the next generation of this church? I think about Amanda and John that show up faithfully every Sunday. They sacrifice the opportunity to be in here with their children to be next door teaching other people's children. How do we grow that ministry? How do we help them? How do we? Because our model has been the same model that every other church has had. We're just going to pray that Jesus Christ brings them in. And he's given us a plan in that little book that we carry in the door every Sunday. Go. Go tell somebody about Jesus. Go. Go tell the good news. The plan's right there, but we ignore it. Well, we just need Jesus to show up. Jesus is already here. Problem ain't Jesus. Problem's in our own hearts. Is it worth it? What would you give to see somebody else make it to heaven? Man, Lord, you gave me a hard one this morning. This is a hard message. I know what some of us would give to see our own children go to heaven. Right? No doubt. We would take that punishment for them. But what about somebody else's? Obviously, money doesn't buy it. It doesn't work that way. It takes callous knees and voices that are willing to speak. That's what it takes. I just wonder if the Church of God and Branch has got callous knees yet. Have we pleaded and been on, the, on our knees before God saying, God, give us someone. Give us one more. <clears throat> I struggled with sharing this this morning, but I believe that God wants me to, so I'm going to share it. Last night, my family sat down and we watched a movie, and it's a horrendous movie called Hacksaw Ridge. It's a military movie. And in this movie, there's a young man that's a, a believer and he does not believe, it's a true story, based on true story. He doesn't believe in guns. He doesn't believe in shooting people. So he goes to war and he fights his way into war to rescue those that have been wounded. And he goes straight into the battle with no gun. And every time he gets one back to safety, he says, Lord, give me one more. Lord, give me one more. And over and over again, people called him a coward. People said that he didn't, he didn't need to be in war because it was going to cost somebody else their life because he wasn't willing to defend his own life. But he ran endlessly into the battle. One more, Lord, one more. And I think about the little line that I read you earlier that talks about the sacrifice, true sacrifices, when you get to a place where your life means nothing except for worship to God. He was willing to run into the heat of the battle, to face the enemy, to rescue somebody else. All the while praying, Lord, give me one more. God is looking for people in this church today that will get a burden for lost souls, for hurting and broken souls that will be willing to say, Lord, I'll go, I'll go. Give me one more. Give me one more for the kingdom. And I'm telling you, there are women in this church that know how to pray. And I believe that God's wanting to stir the hearts of some women in this church to say, you know what? You may not physically be able to go, but you can sit in your chair and you can get before the throne of God and you can pray, Lord, give Give us one more. Give us one more. Help me to reach one more for your kingdom. It's part of the battle. 
See, there's some, some people in this church that are going to be prayer warriors and they're going to be the ones that are going to sound the battle cry, Satan, we're coming after the people that you've stolen from us. We're going to pray these people into the kingdom. I'm just wondering how many people here are willing to step up and say, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready for the battle. I'm willing to step in. I'm willing to go to be the voice in the desert, to sound the alarm. You know, we're living in perilous times. We're living in some dark days. There's people in our community that are literally scared to death of what's going to happen in November. There are people in, in this community that are struggling to figure out where they're going to get food for the next day because inflation is so high they can't even afford to own a home anymore. They're scared to death. Something's going to happen. Where do the people that have the voice in the desert have hope? That can say, you know what? I found Jesus. I was once lost, but he found me. And all those lies that you've heard all your life about God and religion, they're just that, they're lies. Because there is a Savior in heaven that loves you. And you know what? He's not going to take the battles away, but boy, he's going to be right there with you in the battle. And there's nobody better to have beside you going through the storm. Too often we preach the false message of Jesus and we tell everybody, well, when you give your life to Jesus, things are going to get great. Nope, they're not. In this world, you're going to have troubles, but guess what? There's nobody to better have with you in troubles than God the one that can see past the storm, the one that can see past the battle. And he loved us enough to do that for us. Do we love him enough to go tell others? It's the question of the hour. Are we willing to lay down our life so that somebody else can find Jesus? Man, I've wrestled with this this week. I'm going to tell you Monday night about 10, 15, 10, 20, when I finally got back to my cabin. After three kids came up to me, I just want to go home. I'm not having fun. This ain't fun. I don't want to go. I just want to go home. I went and walked back over to the nurse and I said, can I have some pain pills? My back's hurting. My knees hurting. My hips are hurting. I just want to go home. I got a comfy pillow and a, and a beautiful wife that I can sleep with. And she goes, suck it up, big boy. You got three more days. We play that sometimes in our life. Woe is me. This is so rough, Lord. You've called me to such a hard work. But is it really? What a joy to serve God. Man, if you are not having fun as a Christian, you're not doing it right, guys. Christianity is fun. Following God is fun. Telling others about Jesus is fun. Being a light in a dark world is fun. I've got to light you guys up before we leave. It's fun. If you see pictures on the internet this week of your pastor, yeah, that truly was me wearing those wigs. I was wearing those goofy hats. I was having fun. Why? Because I love Jesus. And I want those kids to experience the Jesus that I know. Oh, them, them little girls had fun with me. I like your hair, Pastor Isaiah. That's pretty. Where did you get it done? And I said, you know, I got a question for you little girls. What's that? I said, I always hear people talking about teasing their hair. How do you do that? Is it like, oh, you're so ugly. You're so fat. And they start giggling at me. No, to tease your hair, you got to comb it backwards. And I said, well, that's going to make it look like this, you know. But we had a lot of fun. Because serving God's fun. It's supposed to be fun. Right? You can't tell me sharing your faith with somebody and them saying, yeah, I want to accept Jesus. And you say, repeat after me. And they repeat after you that that's not going to make you happy. That's why I did youth ministry for so many years. Because, man, you see the highs and lows, but there's nothing better than that kid coming in saying, Pastor, I haven't said the F word in seven days. I quit smoking. I quit drinking. I quit cutting myself. That's the kind of testimonies you hear in youth ministry. 
And we come in here, paint it all up, act like we're pretty, and we have no problems. Us adults, we, we were really bad, you know that? We come in, put a, a smile on, we know that we went through hell all week. Went through depression, we've been battling anger, we've been battling all these things, and boy, we walk in, may have had a fight with our spouse on the way in the parking lot. Well, how are you, brother? I'm good. You don't get that in youth ministry and kids ministry. They'll just tell you like it is. Pastor, you know how I wear a hoodie in here even in the summertime? Yeah. There's a reason why. I hate myself. And I cut myself and I can't stop. Sad. Say, well, let me tell you about somebody that can help. Let me tell you about the answer. We want to see God move in our churches. We're going to have to be a little bit more transparent. We're going to have to be a little bit more willing to get on that altar. <laughs> Say, God, I got, to get, I got to deal with some things because I can't do this with this in my life. Right? Some of us have stopped short of our sanctification process. God's wanting to take us farther. I've had people tell me, I know God called me to be a preacher, but I, you know, I, I, I deal with some sins in my life and I don't want to have to deal with them. I just want to keep... You're missing out, man. You're missing out. You know, you're holding on to ugly things when there's something more beautiful to hold on to. Can we bow our heads this morning? Let's just, let's just close a prayer. I know I've laid a lot on us this morning. I know this has been difficult and different than what you're used to.